Hello listeners. Typically when I begin one of these talks, I tell you what the talk is going to be about right at the beginning. I'm not going to do that with this talk. Instead, I would like you to engage in a thought experiment. Imagine the classic situation of boiling a frog in a pot. That is, there is a, a frog in a pot on a stove and the temperature of the, the stove is slowly being increased to the point where eventually the, the water will boil and the frog will boil. Now apparently this isn't true. Uh, a frog will actually jump out of the water, but in this this analogy, the frog doesn't notice the water steadily increasing in temperature and it is boiled without even realizing that that is occurring. So let's just go with that analogy, not with the actual truth that the frog would jump out once the, the water reached a particular temperature. Now imagine in this thought experiment that there is you and there is also one other person and that other person is trying to boil the frog and that person is also very strong stronger than you and you want to stop the frog from being boiled how would you go about doing that well the traditional approach is and and i suppose also the most obvious approach is to try to turn the heat down as your opponent is trying to turn the heat up. Imagine there's a, a dial and you're trying to turn it counterclockwise and the other person is trying to turn it clockwise and increase the heat. So this is the, the most obvious and also the, the traditional approach to preventing the frog from being boiled. However, this has not been working so far because your opponent is stronger than you. The dial is steadily being turned in a clockwise direction. He's, he's turning it and you're trying to turn it back the other way, but you're steadily losing and the temperature is steadily increasing. And this has been happening so far. So why would it suddenly start to work? So... Perhaps there are some other approaches that could be employed to stop the frog from being boiled. One might be to sabotage the pot or the stove in some way. So you could knock the pot over, you could unplug the stove, you could damage the stove. There might be some other methods also. The problem with this approach, of course, is that your opponent is stronger than you and by you doing this, he would then, in some sense, at least in his mind, be justified in using force against you. And because he's stronger than you, he would win. And then all he would do is, after he had beaten you, knocked you out or, or whatever, physically removed, removed you from the room or something like that, he would then begin the process anew. He might have to start right from the beginning, but he would begin anew. And then he would have no opposition at that point, And eventually the frog would be boiled. So this possibility doesn't go anywhere good. I believe there are two other possibilities that could be tried. The first one is, what if you suddenly stopped resisting and took your hand off the knob, the dial, and simply allowed your opponent to turn the heat up? Because you had been resisting him, he, he would have been pushing quite hard. And then, all of a sudden, without the resistance, he would turn it up really quickly. And in so doing, he might turn it up too quickly, the frog might notice and jump out of the pot. So that's one possibility. Further to that idea is the second possibility, which is, what if you actually helped him turn it up as quickly as possible? So rather than resisting him and pushing in a counterclockwise direction, what if you suddenly helped him to turn it very quickly in a clockwise direction. And again, in that situation, the heat would increase quite dramatically, quite quickly, and the frog would jump out of the pot because it would know what was going on. And 
your opponent, of course, he would realize what you were doing, but it might be too late for him to really stop you from doing that. So that's the thought experiment for you. Now, some of you may have already guessed what I'm getting to, what the, the actual topic of this talk is. It's about the invasion of Europe, the current invasion of Europe. A lot of people on the right are currently either very angry or very depressed about this invasion that is taking place in Europe. And so they're talking about the demise of Europe and so on and so forth. In this talk, I'm not really going to discuss the invaders themselves. I think a lot has already been written or said about those people and the effect they will have on Europe and so on. I'm taking it as given that pretty much anyone listening to this talk agrees on all of those points, that it, you know, the whole situation is absolutely insane and it's going to lead to an absolute disaster. I'm, I'm pretty much taking it as given that um, everyone sees all of that and where it's going. What I want to talk about is why this is happening now, right now specifically, and what might be going on in the minds of the elite and the cathedral and so on. And I'm not talking about the average cocked left signalling person here, someone holding up a welcome sign at, at a railway station in Germany. You know, the, I'm not talking about those kinds of people, low-level um, leftists. So I'm talking about people fairly high up in the decision process, uh, decision-making process. What's going on in their minds? Why are they doing this right now? What's going on? Okay, so I can think of three explanations. There might be others, but I can think of three different explanations for why this is going on right now in the manner in which it is occurring. The first is that the elite thought they had control over this situation. They thought they, they had control over both the invaders themselves and Europeans. But actually they don't. They have control over neither of those groups. At some point in this crisis, at some point during this summer, I believe, at least according to this explanation, that they lost control. Maybe they didn't expect the sheer numbers and of, of invaders, and maybe they didn't therefore expect that Europeans would, would um, be awakened to what's going on and have such negative reactions in such an intense and quick fashion. But one way or another, they've lost control over this, and they're now engaged in some kind of damage control, whilst also trying to make it appear as though they haven't lost control, and that they haven't been caught off guard by all of this. So that's one explanation. And that's a fairly obvious explanation. It's a fairly straightforward explanation. Another fairly obvious or um, straightforward explanation is that Given their successes over recent decades, the elite have come to believe their own lies, um, they are drunk on power, all of that sort of thing, and they have reached a point where they think they can basically do whatever they want, they can get away with whatever they want, because they have so far, and they have steadily become more and more bold in the um, things that they have tried and the things that have been successful. So they have become extremely complacent, in a sense, about enacting all of this. Another possibility that that might be the case, something that I think is at least as likely as the others, and I think it's a combination to some extent of these three things, but another one that I think a lot of people are not necessarily considering right now, is that the elite actually understand what's going on. Um, they understand that Europeans are starting to wake up. The frog is beginning to murmur, so to speak, and Europeans are getting sick of this whole situation. I think this really needs to be considered, uh, that the elite are beginning to get very worried about all of this, in particular, I think they might be concerned, firstly, that the um, 
there might be an electoral response to this. They've seen the rise of Eurosceptic parties and what are deemed to be far-right parties and so on, many of which are not really very far-right at all. But nevertheless, they've seen the rise of these parties and the increase in popularity for these parties, even if they haven't done particularly well in terms of the numbers of seats or being able to gain um, uh, control government and so on. In some cases they have, so in Hungary they have, they have control of government. In other places they haven't, so Sweden or the UK for instance. I believe in particular they're very worried about France because France seems to be awakening quite quickly and there is a, an election in 2017. It's less than two years away now until the French election. And I believe that they're concerned about this um, because it's one thing for a country such as Hungary or even Greece to, to go to the right. But those are small countries and they can be punished in various ways by the EU and other um, internationalist organizations and they can be forced to fall in line one way or another. But France is a whole different situation to Hungary. France is pretty much at the core of Europe. France and Germany are really the two, the two core countries in the EU. Um, both in terms of geography and population, the size of their economies and so on. And so if France goes, then that's pretty much it for the EU. And um, Marine Le Pen has, has said that, that she's, um, she doesn't like the EU. She, she wants France to withdraw from, from all of this. So, you know, if France goes, that's it, basically. Um, so I, I believe they're, they're worried about France. And there are other elections coming up. Um, Sweden has one in 2018. So I believe it's September. So it, that's three years away. Germany has an election in 2017. I can't remember which month it is, but that's approximately two years away. Now, I'm not really sure that Germany would, would go... Um, hard to the right who knows though if if um you know if in, if in another two years this this um whole invasion has progressed who can say what what will or would happen in germany um as for sweden i think what will happen is in sweden is that the swedish democrats will pro probably increase their their share of the vote but they will simply be locked of um governing by all other parties. I actually think that um, the National Front in France with Marine Le Pen um, will not be the, um, the white knight that those on the right hope it will be, simply because the peculiarities of the, the French presidential system are such that there's a runoff. So they have a general... Um, vote for for presidential candidates and then they eliminate all but the top two in terms of how many um, votes they get and then they have a runoff between those two um, candidates and the problem that the national front has always faced in french elections and will probably continue to face is that it's going to be able to get 50 percent of the vote by itself. No one does actually in France or, or no one has recently. And so what happens is that it goes to a runoff every time and as always happens there, there is a sort of a, um, a tacit agreement amongst everyone else that if the National Front ever get to the runoff and I believe the last election was the first time that's happened. I could be wrong about that, but I think it was the first time at the last election that that has happened. There is a tacit agreement that if the socialists are in the runoff, then all of the people in what's now the um, the Republicans, they changed their name, I think they were previously called the, the UMP, um, 
but they're now called the Republicans, they're the centre-right party, that if there's a socialist in the runoff against Marine Le Pen, then the, um, the people in the um, Republican Party, those supporters, will vote for the socialist and vice versa. Um, though, of course, some people would defect to Marine Le Pen, but it's not quite clear whether she would get over the line or not. In some polls, she would actually get over the line in certain matchups against different candidates. But generally speaking, she wouldn't get over the line, according to most of the polls I've seen. Though these polls are a couple of months old, so who knows. But nevertheless, that could all change, and France could step farther to the right. The National Front could actually become very popular to the point where they would win a runoff. And I believe that the... Um, the people in the EU and so on, are not going to risk that happening. They they wouldn't want that to be out of their hands, really. They don't want it to even get there. So I think that what they would do is... Um, because if, if, if that happened, there is no way they would let the National Front take power, because that would mean the end of all of this, this invasion and the EU in general. And so, of course, to then stop that, they would have to basically overturn democracy and they would completely lose the moral high ground in doing so because everyone needs to be seen to support democracy, at least at this point in time. Otherwise, they're seen as you know being a bunch of fascists and rah, 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 right? So they would lose the moral high ground and there would be a big reaction to that in all likelihood. So they don't even want it to get to that point. Instead, I believe what they want to do is in some manner um, cause the the far right to lose its own legitimacy. So according to this, this um, third possibility, what they would do is they want to cause a reaction. They want to sort of cause a kind of a pre-crisis and then cause... and then have the crisis to be caused by the far right. And in so doing, um, the far right would lose legitimacy. Um, because currently, although although people are opposed overwhelmingly in all European countries to this invasion, they're not ready for war at this point. Or they're not ready for someone to step in and seize power through non-democratic means. And so I think it's true that if the, the far right were to try to do something like that at this point, they would lose legitimacy. Um, most people are not that red-pilled that, that, that far or um, in, in large enough numbers yet. They might get there soon enough if the elites keep this up. If, if the invasion continues through the rest of this year, into next year, into 2017... I could see a lot of people becoming quite red-pilled with that, um, from that. But nevertheless, I believe that what the elite want to do is cause the um, the far right to make the first move and in so doing lose legitimacy. Um, they, they, they hope that the far right will react really harshly to this. Um, now, of course, the problem then would be that if the far right lost legitimacy in this manner, then it would take them quite some time to recover from it because the um, the EU and the states and so on would would step on them quite harshly, um, both through through the law, but also there would be public opinion that would support them in doing so, um, and that that would completely um, cast the far right into disarray. And by the time they recovered from that, both in terms of reorganising themselves, but also in um, regaining the trust of the people and all of that sort of stuff, because there'd be a huge amount of propaganda against them from that point onwards, um, it would be too late at that point. That, that could take at least another generation, um, if not longer. And by then, the demographics would be completely against them, and Europeans would quite likely even be in a minority within their own countries at that point. So I think that what the elites are hoping to do is force the far right to overplay their hand and that will cut them out of the process until it's too late 
essentially. Now, as I said at the the um, beginning of this talk, there might be two ways to approach this that haven't been tried already. Everyone seems to be very concerned about resisting this invasion at this point. Um, it might be better to to literally just take your hand off the dial and let this happen really quickly. I actually think it's a good thing that this is happening so intensely, so quickly, because I think the elites are overplaying their hand in all of this. Um, if the same numbers had come in over a decade or more, which they would have, because it doesn't seem as though um, immigration to Europe is in any way abating. No, no one is really seriously saying that's going to come to a halt. So you'd have to imagine that the same numbers would have come in just over a longer period of time. And I believe that would have been far worse for several reasons, but I'll, I'll mention two. The first one is simply because by that point, the number of Europeans would have dropped because they're not um, replacing themselves and they're getting older and those older people are dying off and so on. And so the, the relative percentages of Europeans would have dropped, which would have put them in a worse position. And of course, um, the, the converse of that is the relative numbers of non-Europeans would have increased. But also because, um, even aside from those relative percentages, the invaders would have become far more entrenched in one way or another. They, they, they wouldn't have fully integrated, but they would have become accepted to one degree or another. Not necessarily a lot, but, but still more than they would or, or are being accepted right now. So it would be much more difficult to unseat them. So... Europeans are going to have to confront this at some point, whether it's now or in a year or in 10 years or 20 years, whenever. They are going to have to confront this problem at some point. There is not going to be a happy ending here. These people, we, we know all the, the whole thing. They're, they're not going to fit in. They're always going to be a problem and they don't belong there. So why not do it now? Why not confront this issue now rather than when it's worse in X number of years. Why not do it now when the situation for Europeans is better than it would be in a few years? Because it's not even like Europeans would say, okay, just give us a few years and we'll sort of all prepare behind the scenes and then we'll resist. That's not going to happen. They're just going to go about doing whatever they do, you know, taking their six week vacations and buying the latest me phone and all of this other stuff, right? They're not going to secretly prepare a resistance. So I think it's better to do it now rather than five years or ten years. And really anyone who opposes this at any point, they're going to be labelled a Nazi anyway. right? So why not accept that label, wear it to some extent. Appeasement is never going to work with all of the, with, with these kinds of situations. Now, r real edgelords might, might want to go one step farther and that's the... Um, suggestion of um, helping the person trying to boil the frog by actually quickly jerking their hand um, in a clockwise fashion so that the um, the temperature increases even more quickly um, and and basically by advocating for the most absurd things possible so they might say well you know if Germany is going to get um, 800,000 invaders this year but that's not enough, you know, that's rah, rah, you know, go on about how that's, that's really right wing or that's callous or something and, and say, why not make it 8 million this year? Um, you know, advocate for the most absurd possibility. Um, and, and rather than giving them whatever 2000 euros each per month, say, why not give them 12,000 euros per month or 20,000 euros per month and just advocate for the most absurd things possible, really push the envelope not because you actually want that. And this harks back to that, that, um, that talk that I made about um, outflanking the left from the left. Basically, the idea is to trigger the hell out of anyone who has not already been red-pilled and anyone who is not already opposed to this. 
So people who might have thought, well, you know, we have to be compassionate and you know, we have to give them some money to live here, obviously, get, get it to the point where they think, no, come on, this is just ridiculous now. And they become red pilled. So I don't know whether that would work or not. And, and it is pretty extreme, but nevertheless, that's a possibility. But I, I believe that things need to come to a head very soon. It's better that they come to a head very soon. Now, it was about the argument that the elites are aware of all of this, and they're now trying to push the far right into overplaying their hand and losing legitimacy. What I would say about that is that I think um, the far right obviously does need to be aware of that. Um, but they don't need to be the one to make the first move, actually. The invaders, because of the nature of these invaders, they're not exactly the um, brightest crayons in the box. Um, and, you know, they have very high time preference and so on. Um, they're going to screw up in a big way at some point. They can't help it, you know. They are what they are, right? Um, and so... Just as the cathedral have recently had their photo of a dead kid on a beach, soon enough there will be all sorts of photos and footage. And the far right just needs to have people there with cameras and video cameras. But there will be all sorts of photos and footage of actual atrocities. Not manufactured tragedies, but actual atrocities that will occur in Europe. There will be images of dead people. There will be images of raped women and children, there will be images of, of things burning and so on and so forth. The right just needs to be there to document it and then put that on the internet, just hammer that home non-stop. They need to sort of win the, um, the meme war because, okay, look, the traditional media and so on, they're not going to show that kind of stuff. They won't. But so much occurs online now that I think it would be impossible to stop the right from from showing that online. Um, and of course, respond. I mean, if, if they attack you, I'm not advocating um, um, being a pacifist here, um, but let them make the first move, and they will. They will, because they can't help it. They are what they are. So they can't help it, and they will. And look, it's not a matter of me hoping these things will happen and taking some sort of perverse delight in this. These things are going to happen. They have already happened all over the place. You know, we've had Rotherham. We've had people be having their heads cut off in the streets in Europe. We've had every every summer thousands of cars get burnt in Paris alone. You know, we've, we've seen all the stuff happening in Sweden and so on. It's going to happen. It's already happening. It's already happened. So it's not a matter of what I want or don't want or what anyone else wants or doesn't want. This is going to happen. It's going to continue to happen simply because of the people involved, the two groups of people involved, the invaders and the soft locals, or a third group and the elite, right? Because of that um, combination of those three groups, these things are going to continue to happen. But, of course, with this massive wave of enrichment that has suddenly occurred, they will happen more frequently and they will be more intense when they do happen. So... The right just needs to be there to document it and then defend themselves if necessary. But they, they certainly don't in any way need to be the, those to, to throw the first punch or cast the first stone by any means. Um, that's, that's going to happen from, uh, from the invaders. And, you know, the cathedral, the cathedral is always willing to play... Um, the game. They're always willing to use every dirty trick in the book. And if if the right is not prepared to make political hay out of these things, out of um, people being killed and raped and all of the looting and pillaging and so on, if the right says, well, it wants to continue um, uh, following some sort of decorum, they're going to lose. They need to learn how to play this, this public image game. They need to learn how to um, do all of the same things that the cathedral is quite willing to do, has, has shown it is quite willing to do. They need to have no qualms about doing that. This is a war. This is an invading force. There is a, a treasonous elite ruling over Europe at the moment. 
these people are not your friends. They're not honorable and so on and so forth. So you either fight fire with fire or you're going to lose. It's as simple as that. I believe the moment of resolution is rapidly approaching in Europe. This is going to be resolved one way or another fairly soon because everything's moving forward. The, the timeline is moving forward very quickly. So things will be resolved fairly soon within the next few years. I believe within the next five years. Preparation is going to go a very long way towards mitigating the carnage on the way to victory. Europe will be victorious. Europeans will be victorious. They will. You need to believe that. They are going to be victorious, but it will not be without cost. But preparing for this will help to mitigate that cost, that carnage on the way to victory. So all of you need to start thinking about what you're going to do personally what you and those immediately around you are going to do, and so on. You need to start preparing accordingly in, in every sense, in terms of networking, in terms of um, making sure that you're able to withstand it at every level within your, as, as an individual, uh, within your family, what you're going to do with your house, how you're going to have supplies, all of this sort of stuff. You need to start thinking about how you're going to prepare for this. Now, as I mentioned fairly early on in this talk, a lot of people are very angry and a lot of people are very upset about this. A lot of people are very disillusioned. And I've read a lot of comments saying, oh, Europe is lost, rah, rah, rah. Europe is not lost. These people are still a tiny minority of the populace. And I know there are a lot of cucked people on the left. Many of those are going to rapidly come over to the right. Europe is by no means lost at this point. Don't be disheartened because of the present situation. Think of how you arrived at your, your present position, the way you think about everything, the way you were red-pilled. Think about the process that was involved and how long that has taken and what caused you to become red-pilled. If it's happened to you, because some of you have always been on the right, but many of you have not always been on the right, or at least not the far right. Think about how you arrived at the point that you're at today. Think of how many other people you've met on the ultra-right or the reactor sphere or whatever you want to call it, who have also undergone the same process or a very similar process, similar kinds of events and so on. People like you, people like me, people like us, are growing in number every day. They're changing. They're being red-pilled. Many other people who you consider to be quite cocked right now, they're just at a point that you were at six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, whenever it was that you were at that point also. They're going to come over to where you're at very rapidly now because everything is accelerating. Do not lose hope in all of this because very soon the frog is going to jump out of the pot. Thanks for listening.